Hi everyone. When reading history books, it is easy to assume that any sentence with an endnote must be true. The thoughts that an author just happened to come up with can take on the appearance of objective neutral fact when they are printed on a page. The process of becoming a historian is, to a significant extent, about confronting the extent to which our knowledge of the past is built on shaky foundations. Primary sources which contradict one another are open to numerous interpretations, can be easily misunderstood, contain ambiguities, reflect a biased viewpoint, and so on. Things only get harder when one lacks access to the relevant primary sources and is instead forced to rely on the conflicting opinions of other historians. To illustrate this point, I'm going to examine a single topic. In 1927, a specific anarchist organisation called the Iberian Anarchist Federation, or FI, was founded. I briefly discuss this organisation in my forthcoming book, Means and Ends, The Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Europe and the United States, which is now available to pre-order from AK Press in America or AK Press in the UK. The book is an overview of the ideas that anarchists developed in order to change the world, it explains not only what anarchists thought, but also why they did so. If you pre-order now, you'll get a small discount. That, that's my advertisement. I'm not very good at self-promotion. A discerning reader might wonder why I do not provide a membership figure for the FI. The reason is that every source I've read gives a different number, and at the time of writing, I was yet to figure out the correct answer. In this essay, I am going to go through all the evidence I am familiar with, and thereby establish why the topic is so complicated. In so doing, I aim to demonstrate that writing history books is a total nightmare, which no one should do. Let us begin. George Woodcock claims that the FI had 30,000 members in 1936 and 150,000 members in 1938. Woodcock is generally unreliable and often wrong. As I've said in previous videos, only basic bitches cite George Woodcock. Peter Marshall, who is generally better than Woodcock but still makes errors, asserts that the FI never had more than 30,000 members. David Miller, whose book on anarchism is bad and you should not read it, I mean, like, I had to read it as part of my PhD because I had to, like, read all the literature, but, like, no one else should read it. It's, it's, not, it's not a good book. Um, anyway... David Miller claims that in the early 1930s, the FI had some 10,000 members. I've only cited three authors, and already there are three different positions. It is, in addition to this, difficult to compare the numbers because the size of any organisation varies over time. Other authors note that it is difficult to establish how many people were in the FI because it was a secret organisation. Such claims typically go alongside very different estimates of how large the FI was. Gerald Brennan writes that, As the FI was a secret organisation, no figures of its strength have been published. One may assume, however, that from 1934 to 1936, its membership lay around 10,000. Murray Bookching provides a much larger membership figure. He notes that, Owing to the FI's passion for secrecy, we know very little about its membership figures. Judging by data published by Diago Abad de Santelian, a leading FIista, the figure on the eve of the Civil War may have been close to 39,000. Hugh Thomas, in comparison, writes that in 1930, the FI's organisation and numbers were unknown. He provides no membership figure for this period. Later in the book, Thomas asserts that by 1937, the Socialist Party now numbered only 160,000, the FI much the same number. Chris Ilham, a specialist in the history of anarchism in Spain, claims that the FI only had around 2,000 members in 1931. Different numbers are provided by Stuart Christie. He claims that between 1927 and 1930, which as all nerds know, was during the CNT's period of illegality under the Primo de Reviva dictatorship, it is unlikely that FI national membership exceeded 1,000. 
After the inauguration of the Republic and the legalization of the CNT, the size of the phi increased to a pre-1937 height of an estimated 5,500 members in late 1933. The size of the phi subsequently decreased to an estimated 3,500 in 1936. Casas provides higher figures. He claims that the phi had around 10,000 members in 1933. He writes that, by February 1936, the phi had 496 groups in all of Spain. If one estimates 10 members per group, which was high in many instances, the phi had fewer than 5,000 members. Later in his book, Casas writes that, a general count of organized groups at the February 1937 plenum tallied 5,000 phi members. The figure could be 7,000, if we add groups not counted at the plenum for various reasons. It is difficult to evaluate which membership figures are true. This is because in most instances, the secondary sources do not explain how they arrived at the number they give. Authors usually just assert a number and do not back it up with a source I can easily track down. Brennan tells us that, one may assume that the Phi had 10,000 members between 1939 and 1936, but I have absolutely no idea why we should make this assumption. Bukching refers to data published by the Phi member Santalian, but I have been unable to find this myself. On other occasions, the secondary source does provide a clear citation, but I cannot find a copy of the book. For example, Ilham's position that the Phi had only 2,000 members in 1931 cites Claveria's book Workers in Catalonia, but there is no PDF of it online. Even I am not going to buy a book in a language I cannot read in order to find one citation. Although I, I, I almost did, like I, I was really tempted. I, I wanted to buy the book, but it was, it was a bit too expensive. I couldn't really justify it to myself. Uh, you know, I could get a whole video game for the cost of the book, and I was just like, I don't think it's worth it. it, it it's, it's one really minor claim about how big the file was in 1931. I'll probably just open the book, and, and it will just have 2,000 members listed, and a, and a primary source or something that is in a language I, I also cannot speak. So I was just, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But I, I was really tempted to. Like, I, I put it in my shopping cart, and then I was just like... No, I can't, I can't do this. I can't let myself be that person. Anyway. Eoham's figure might be derived from an article by the famous Spanish anarchist Deruti, who, as all true anarcho-nerds know, was not a member of the Phi, but knew people who were, and he often spoke in the name of the Phi during debates within the CNT, and this leads to people who don't know what they're talking about to claim that Deruti was in the Phi, but he, he wasn't, like, in this period. That's just wrong. Like... You know, read Stuart Christie and Jason Garner. It's like they both point this out. There's no excuse at this point to, to repeat the error. It's one of my pet peeves. Like it, it really annoys me. Anyway, in the 1931 article, Deruti wrote that we of the Phi have only 2,000 members enrolled in the Confederation. This could be where Ilham gets his figure from, but it, it could also not be. I don't actually know. I'm just making an educated guess because the number and date, like, they align so well, but, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know for certain. Woodcock and Marshall both give the number of 30,000 members, but neither provide a citation for this. This number probably comes from Jose Peretz, who was an important member of the CNT and briefly secretary of the Barcelona Federation of the Phi. In Volume 2 of the CNT in the Spanish Revolution, he wrote that, Although the so-called specific organization held great sway over the CNT and its committees, for nearly every one of the five members belonged to the Confederation, its numbers were quite limited by comparison with the magnitude of the CNT. The size of the five prior to the Army Revolt of 1936 may be reckoned at around 30,000. Although Peratz was a participant in the CNT and the Phi, I should not assume that the number he provides is correct. This is because Peretz is writing a history book in the early 1950s, decades after the events he is describing. He may be misremembering how large the Phi was, or 
repeating information he was told by other people that is, without him realising, inaccurate. Peretz does not explain where this figure comes from, but it appears to be an educated guess, given his use of the expression, may be reckoned at around. In order to properly evaluate the number provided by Peretz, I need to compare his account with the numbers provided by other members of the five. Unfortunately, the vast majority of primary sources written by anarchists in Spain have not been translated into English. As a result, I am forced to rely on tiny fragments of information quoted in secondary sources. This is often frustrating because secondary sources do not always provide the information I need in order to interpret the claims made by the primary source. For example, Ilham cites a letter where Peratz claims that, at its high point, the FI had no more than 30,000 members in Spain, with an estimated 3,750 in Barcelona. In an endnote, Ilham adds the detail that Fidel Moreau, another member of the FI, claimed that there were only around 300 members in Barcelona. And this is why you should always read all the endnotes. Like, I don't understand people who, don't, who read history books but don't read all the endnotes. Like, you have to read all the endnotes, otherwise you haven't read the book. Like, it, they often contain really important details. A friend told me that like, people don't read endnotes, and I was like, what? Like, what? Why? What's wrong with them? You should read endnotes. Ilham does not specify which period Moreau is talking about, and thereby prevents me from being able to compare the figures. In order to solve this puzzle, I had to look for Moreau's name in the indexes of various books, until I discovered that Christie discusses the same passage by Moreau. Christie writes, Moreau claims that, although no one knows for certain the total number of FI affiliates in Barcelona, generally considered to be the heart of the specific organisation, at no time prior to July 1936 was it in excess of 300. The best primary source for the membership of the FI prior to the Civil War is the organisation's October 1933 National Plenum. I lack access to the complete minutes of this plenum and have to instead rely on two secondary sources. These secondary sources interpret the same numbers in fundamentally different ways. According to Christie, the 1933 plenum was attended by 21 delegates, representing 569 groups and 4,839 members. Groups from Levant and Asturias were unable to send delegates to the plenum and instead forwarded letters of support. If these groups are included in the total membership of the FI, then the federation was composed of 632 groups and 5,334 members. Casas gives a different account of the same event. He claims that 22 delegates attended the Peninsula Plenum in Madrid in late October 1933, representing 569 groups with 4,834 members, and they received letters of affiliation from 632 groups with 5,334 members, a total of 10,173 members almost the same count as in 1931 and 1932. There is, in short, a disagreement about whether the figure of 632 groups and 5,334 members refers to the total membership of the FI, or just the FI groups who sent letters of support to the plenum. Casas quotes the minutes of the plenum at length, but does not quote the part about the letters of support that were sent in. Given this, I have to make a number of educated inferences from the evidence that is available. First, when Casas claimed that the plenum was attended by 22 delegates, this was a typo. His own source refers to 21 delegates. Second, it is very unlikely that over half of the organisation did not send a delegate to the plenum. The minutes list the number of groups per region. The largest was in Catalonia, where there were 206 groups. This should be the largest number of five groups in a region, since it is where the CNT was largest in Spain, and basically every member of the FI was also a member of the CNT. The second largest region for five groups was Andalusia, with 119 groups. Almost every other region had less than 50 groups, with some as low as just 10. On the basis of this, I have concluded that Christie's account is 
probably correct. The majority of authors I have read claim that the thigh grew in size during the Spanish Revolution and Civil War. It is nonetheless not clear how large the thigh became. The Secretary of the Phi Peninsula Committee announced in 1937 that the Phi had 160,000 members. Alejandro Gilabert, who was Secretary of the Barcelona Federation of the Phi, claimed in an August 1937 article for Solidaridad Obrera that the Phi had 30,000 members in Barcelona alone. These numbers should not be automatically trusted. They could be inflating membership figures in order to make the FI appear more important than they actually were, and thereby persuade new people to join the organisation. This seems to be the case, given that, as was previously mentioned, Casas refers to a February 1937 plenum of the FI that did a general count of organised groups, and listed only 5,000 members. Even if membership figures dramatically increase between February and August, it is unlikely that they increased that much. But I could be wrong about that. I'm just making an educated guess. Having gone through the evidence, I can establish a number of exciting conclusions. First, the size of the FI is difficult to establish due to it being a secret organisation. Second, the FI had at least a few thousand members during the early to mid 1930s. Third, the size of the FI increased during the Spanish Civil War. Establishing these minor conclusions took a huge amount of work and lots of time looking through the indexes of history books. I cite 11 books in this essay, but read far more that mentioned the FI several times, but never specified how large the organisation was. Despite all this work, my knowledge of the past is extremely limited. I'm largely relying on secondary sources citing the minutes of plenums that I did not attend and which I have not read in an archive. I am trusting that Christian and Cassas accurately repeat what the original primary sources claim, and that the people who wrote the primary sources were providing correct information. It should also be kept in mind that I could have missed crucial information in the books that I do cite. I carefully looked through the indexes and relevant chapters, but did not reread multiple books from start to finish in order to answer my question. Some days when working on this essay, I had bad sleep, or was feeling stressed out, and this affected my ability to process the information I was reading. I try to counteract this issue by double-checking all my page references and claims before I release anything. The problem I have is that when I do this, I am not always operating at peak condition. If I had the time and energy, I would triple-check my double-checking. This is, of course, an infinite regress. I can always keep fact-checking my fact-checking. At some point I have to accept that, what I have written is as good as I can realistically make it. When reading history books, it can be easy to forget that they are written by flawed and perfect people, trying their best to understand and write about very complex topics. I could have read Brennan's figure of 10,000 members first, and then repeated it as fact, without realising how controversial this number is. During the course of writing my book, which you can pre-order now, I routinely thought I understood a topic given why I had read. I then researched more and read new research on the topic and realised that I had been wrong or that the topic was far more complicated than I had initially thought. The consequence of these experiences is that I am now permanently paranoid that I might be wrong about something because I stopped digging for information. This paranoia goes alongside a constant frustration at my inability to work as much as I would like. I read very slowly due to dyslexia, and I can only read one to two hours a day without destroying myself. I have a vast number of topics I need to research and have to be very careful about how I use my time. I can only do so much work per day before my brain loses the capacity to read. The consequence of this is that I often have to stop myself from falling too deep down a research rabbit hole. I want to obsessively read about how many members the FI had, but if I do that, I won't be researching other topics, including ones that are like much more important and also complicated and require even more research. And so 
at some point I have to tell myself that I tried my best to establish the answer and need to move on to other work. If I did not do this, I would never finish writing anything. Ultimately, everything I release to the public is work in progress that I decided was good enough and, as far as I could tell at the time, factually correct. Such as my forthcoming book, Means and Ends, The Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Europe and the United States, which you can pre-order now. If you like this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon, so I can keep making weird videos like this, and writing books about the history of anarchism or socialism in general. In exciting news, I have created an Instagram account in order to spread 19th century socialist theory to people who take pictures of their food or selfies of themselves at the gym. Um, so if you have an Instagram account, please follow me. I'm going to be posting a quote by a dead anarchist every day. Anyway, I hope everyone has a nice day and goodbye.